Actively recall that uh, we had the error in the numerical integrations. So the first, if we talk about uh, the error in the trapezoidal rule. So it was given by. This right for some eta is in the interval AB. And okay, underlying problem remains the same that we want to find the approximate value of the integral of F over the interval AB. So this we denote by IF and its approximation is given by one of the integration rules. So which we obtained it in this form. So we called it, I think, I and F. Right. So in the trapezoidal rule, uh, you basically approximate the function by a linear interpolating polynomial, and that's how you obtain the rule. And we obtain that the error is given, uh, given by this. And in the composite trapezoidal rule, upon simplification, we also we obtained. So this we denoted by E1. And for the composite trapezoidal rule, it was given by minus h cube divided by 12. F double prime of eta j for some eta j in AB. And we further simplify this term. Just one minute, okay? I'll do that. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so we simplified this further and we obtained that. That we can write this in this form. For some eta is in A. Right. So likewise, uh, we have the error formulas for the Simpson rule. But in all these uh, error formulas, what we notice that we have the evaluation of the some derivative of the F at some unknown points. Right. And that was the reason that uh, why we really looked for the another form of these uh, error formulas. And the first formula which we saw that was for the trapezoidal rule. So what was the underlying idea of obtaining these uh, piano kernel error formulas? OK, so we made this, re this realization using uh, these formulas for the trapezoidal rule that this rule is exact for the linear polynomials, right? Polynomial of degree less than equal to one. So we made use of this fact and the Taylor theorem. So we wrote fx as a uh, The P1x, which is nothing but the. Also, let me write the expression of the P1x. Uh, 
x minus x minus t into f dash t. Right, and then we had a remainder term, so which was given by the integral of uh, x minus t f double prime t dt. Right. With this, then we will just use this idea that if we find the error in f. So even here is the error in the trippage order rule. So let me use the same notation e1 t. So this is nothing but the the error in this linear interpol linear polynomial p1, and then the error in the remainder term. Right. And since we all have this uh, observation from the formulas which we obtained before that. The triple order rule is exact for the linear linear polynomials, so this is zero. And we further simplified this term, and we obtain that mm -hmm. so this is given by this expression, where k t is nothing but. T minus A into T minus B, right? And then we extended the same idea for the composite triple order rule. And what we had obtained uh, for the error formula, the expression for the error formula. So if we talk about the composite triple order rule, so let's. Uh, so we denoted it by E and T F. So this we again got it in the same form A to B. The integral of F double prime T into a sum function K T times D T. And what was K T we obtained as? So this is one by two. So I think I'm missing the one by two factor here, right? So K T here is one by two times of this. So we obtained uh, this as T minus X J minus one and T minus X J, where T is lying in the interval X J minus one to X J. Okay. So this is with the understanding that we have a uniform partition of the interval a b into n sub intervals. So is it okay so far? Any any questions here? Okay, so now note that uh, let's just uh, focus on this uh, formula which we have obtained for the, the triple rule. That is uh, this one here, and you know that uh, K T here is like a polynomial in T, right? So I can if I want to find an upper bound of this error using this expression, so I can very well take out the maximum of the KT over the interval AB, right? So let me denote it by this notation. Where I'm just using this notation. So if you're familiar with the norms, then this is nothing but the L entreaty norm, and it is nothing but the supremum of supremum, which will be basically maximum because it's a polynomial over the interval AB. Okay, so we had obtained uh, already obtained uh, the error formulas uh, using the, the previous arguments, and now we have obtained an upper bound uh, using this uh, new formula. And you can know, uh, observe that here to make sense of these terms. That is, if I want to find, suppose I find the upper bound using uh, this formula, it suffice for me to have that that f double prime 
is integrable, right? Because in this term, I just what appears is that I just need to integrate f double prime uh, the function the second derivative of the f over the integral a b, right? But for the previous formulas to make sense, I need the supremum of the second derivative of the f over that integral, right? So I need the continuity of the second derivative of the f. Okay. So in that sense, also this formula sometimes uh, gives the better approximation if the f double prime is having a some sharp, uh, sharp jump at some point, or it is the gradient. Uh, so it might happen that the second derivative at some point is not, it's very high, right? So that will make the maximum to be very high, right? But here integral is like averaging. Okay. So in those cases also, the uh, this formula is going to give you better upper bound for the error. Okay. And in this case, uh, we can uh, really find what this quantity is because we explicitly know what kt is. So you can just verify that uh, the maximum of the function kt over the interval ab, it is going to be h square by 8. Okay, so basically what we have is that uh, The upper bound of the error is given by h square by 8 times this term. Okay. All right, so now we are going to apply the same idea for the Simpson rule. Okay, so we want to get the piano kernel error formula for the Simpson's rule. So now you have to tell me what I should do because uh, we have already seen it for the triple order rule. So how I should proceed now? So what information we already know for the Simpson rule? So, okay, can you tell me that uh, Simpson rule is exact for certain polynomial degree, right? So, what is that? Okay, so let me just uh, recall the error formula for the Simpson rule. So, So it was minus h raised to the power 5 divided by 90 and fourth derivative of the f evaluated at some eta which is in the interval a b right so this is for the simpson rule and for the composite simpson rule we obtained the error formula as minus h raised to the power 4 divided by 180 b minus a times the fourth derivative of f evaluated at some eta which is in the interval a right so we have this information that uh, the simpson rule is exact for the polynomial of degree less than or equal to 3 right because the fourth derivative of a cubic polynomial is going to be zero okay so we are going to use this information together with the Taylor's theorem to obtain the error formula for the Simpson rule, a new formula for the Simpson rule. Okay, so uh, how should we uh, proceed? So I'm going to use the Taylor's theorem. But this time I'm going to write fx as a polynomial which is so I'm going to expand it up to a cubic term so I will take it p3x plus r4 of x where what is this p3 can you tell me so I'm expanding fx in the neighborhood of a 
So it is going to be f a plus x minus a f prime a plus x minus a square divided by factorial 2 f double prime a plus x minus a whole cube divided by factorial 3 and third derivative of f evaluated at a. Okay, and what is the error, uh, the truncation error here, the error term here? So it is 1 by 3, fact 1 by 4 factorial. It is going to be 1 by 3 factorial. So this is 1 by 6, right? And uh, a to x, x minus t whole cube, and the fourth derivative of f evaluated at t dt. Okay, so this is from the Taylor's theorem we obtain. So again, uh, one more realization you need here is that this error term that is Yes, I think I used it too before. So let me let's take with the same notice. Huh? So this is in either case, whether it is for the uh, simple Simpson rule or it is for the composite Simpson rule. This is going to be a linear function, meaning if you take a take two functions f and g, and if you find the error in the f plus g, this is going to be the sum of the error in the function f and the sum of the error in the function. G, which you can simply ob observe by the formulas which we obtain. Right? That is this is linear. Okay. So using this, what we can have that the error in F. So, okay, I have to write again and again E. So, let me not complicate the notations. Let me just write the E2F and ENF. Okay, so what is E2F? This is F is the sum of P3 and R4, right? So, this is nothing but the sum of the error in the the function P3 and the error using the Simpson rule in the function R4. Okay, I'm just avoiding writing a function of X every time because you know it will just uh, make the writings more cumbersome. So I'm just it, it's understood that everything is a function of X here. F is a function of X, P3 is a function of X, R4 is a function of X here. Okay, but I'm just avoiding writing it every time. So now what can we say about this quantity? So what is the error in this cubic polynomial using the Simpson rule? Zero. It is going to be zero. Right, so this is. So the error in the function F using the Simpson rule is the same as the error in the function R4. OK, so now let's just expand it because we already know the Simpson rule. So. So what is the approximation of this using the Simpson rule? It is H by 3 F evaluated at A plus 4 times F evaluated at the midpoint plus F evaluated at the, the other end point. Right, so I'm going to use this formula now. So the error is the, the actual value minus the approximate value. So the actual value is integral a to b r4x dx minus the approximate value is this. OK. So uh, we already know what the function R4 is, which is given by this. So let's give the equation numbers. So. So. 
So let's call this is as one. This is as two. This is three. So using three, so I'm just using the expression of the R four X. So it is e to x. 1 by 6 factor is outside and x minus t whole cube fourth derivative of f integral of this complete quantity and then we will also have the integral with respect to x so dt dx minus h by 3 now what what is r4 evaluated at a so this term is 0 zero so we will have the contributions from these two terms so let's write it down so we will have four by six integral a to a plus b by two a plus b by two minus t whole cube fourth derivative of f evaluated at t dt and the second term that is R4 of the B that is going to be 4 by 1 by 6 integral from A to B of the factor B minus T whole Q times F4 T. Okay, so I've just substituted the expression for the function at R4 here. So now let's just simplify. So we apply the same trick that in this term, that is in the first term, if you observe F4 is, the function F4 is basically evaluated at T, right? And so we have a double integration here. So integration variables are T and X, right? X appears only in the this term x minus t whole q. So I can first integrate with respect to x because x is not appearing in this unknown function, right? So I'm just going to use the change of the variable. In the first terms, so first term will become So that is I'm first going to, so at this point, uh, this first integration is with respect to T. So T is varying from A to X, and then we have the X is varying from A to B, right? But now I was first want to integrate with respect to X, right? And then I want to integrate with respect to T, okay? So what are going to be the limits? So this arguments are going to be same. So I'm just changing the, limits for so first i'm going to integrate this to x so x will vary from t to b okay and then t will vary from a to b all right so you can see that if you just try to draw the reason of the integration from here and if you try to change the the orientation of the strip then you will get that these limits are going to be t to b and then a to b And uh, so in this term, so you see that uh, here the integration is from A to A plus B by 2, right? And in the next term, integration is from A to B. So ultimately, you know, I would like to have everything from the A to B because I would like to club the terms together, right? Because once I will integrate here, this term with respect to X, I will have the limits for the T from A to B. Okay, but here I have the limits for the t from a to a plus b by 2. So I will apply the same trick what we did in the case of the uh, composite trapezoidal rule that I can write this term as 4 by 6 integral a to b. And what I have to do here? Minus uh, b to uh, a plus b by 2. 
Yes, but I used a notion for the positive part of the function, right? You recall that uh, when we were uh, you, uh, deriving the piano kernel's error formula for uh, the composite trippage order rule, we were having a different limits, right? A to x1 and then A to x2 and then A to like that, right? And then we converted it into the limit A to B by using that uh, I can define a positive part of the function, right? That is, I can write this as a plus b by 2 minus t. So I want only the positive part of this function, right? So let's uh, recall here that how did we define the positive part of the function? So here, this expression, so let me define it uh, this function itself here. So we have this function and I'm talking about its positive part, right? So this is going to be a plus b by 2 minus t. That is, it will remain the same function, which is a plus b by 2 minus t whole q if t is greater than or equal to this a term. plus b by 2. And it is, of course, going to be less than or equal to B. Okay. And it is going to be zero if. Sorry, it's the other way around. So here I'm writing T is greater than or equal to. So this term is positive part. So this B non zero mm -hmm. only when the in yes. uh, term is fine, it is positive. Okay. That is T is greater than or equal to. So this will happen. When t is less than or equal to a plus b by 2 and then greater than or equal to a. And if t is greater than or equal to a plus b by 2, this means that a plus b by 2 minus t is less than or equal to 0. So then the positive part is going to be 0. Okay. So with this notion, uh, you can observe here that I can break this integral from a to a plus b by 2. And then, so this integral can be written as a to a plus b by 2. And the, whatever the arguments we have here, and then a plus b by 2 to b. Okay. And in this reason, this, in the, this term is going to be 0. So basically, I'll be left with only this term, which is nothing but a2, a plus b by 2, which we originally had. Okay. So let's write down uh, what are its other terms here. So we will have the fourth derivative of the f. And the integral of this complete term. And then the second term is 1 by 6. So this is in the nice form. I don't have to do anything here. B minus T Q F4 T T T. Okay. So if you, I just, uh, okay. Let me just take out the common factors from each of the term. Okay. So I have the integral A to B. And I can notice that I have the fourth derivative of the f coming in each of the term. Right? And rest of the terms, I'm going to combine it and I'm going to call it as kt. Okay, so let me write what exact what is the exact expression for the kt here. So kt is from the first term, I'm going to get it as 1 by 6 integral t to b x minus t whole q dx and then from the second term I will get this as minus h by 3 4 by 6 a plus b by 2 minus t whole q and the positive part of this function and from the last term I will get the contribution as 1 by 6 p minus t whole q. 
ओके सो हियर दिस टर्म वी कैन सिंप्लीफाई सो वी कैन सिंपली इंटीग्रेट दिस सो दिस इज गोइंग टू बी एक्स माइनस टी रेस्ट पर फोर डिवाइडेड बाई फोर and the limits are going to be t to b and here i'm going to take out the factor uh, so let's just multiply h by 3 inside so we will have 4h by 18 a plus b by 2 minus t cube the positive part of this function minus h divided by 18 b minus t whole cube Okay, and if you substitute the limits here in the first term, so the, when you substitute the lower limit, that is x is equal to t, it is going to be zero. Only the upper limit is going to contribute, so it is going to be b minus t raised to power four divided by four minus. So I'm taking one by six from each term, so this is going to be four h by three a plus b by two minus t. Q positive part of this minus h by three b minus t whole cube. Okay, so okay, so we further have to simplify this term, and which really uh, depends on uh, this term because I'm going to have two cases based on this term. So the first case is going to be. So let's consider the easier case first. That is when this term is zero, which means that I'm going to have t is greater than equal to a plus b by two and less than equal to b. So in this case, we know that this term, the positive part of this function, is going to be zero. So, so what I'm left with in the KT, so it is going to be one by six of b minus t raised to the power four divided by four minus H by three, b minus t whole cube. Okay, so I can simplify this. So here I get b minus t divided by four minus h by three. So I can take out this uh, four and three also. So I will have. Uh, Twelve, and this is going to be three times of this minus four times of this. Okay, and we know that h is nothing but. So what is h? Can you tell me? B minus a divided by two, right? Because we are in the case of the simple trip Simpson rule, so it is nothing but the distance. So you have three points A, B, and A plus B by two. So it's nothing but the length of uh, this subintegral, which is nothing but B minus B by two. We find this. We get this as B minus T cube, and H is B minus A by two. So I'm just going to substitute here and simplify. So we'll get is B plus two A minus three T. Okay, so in this case, when t is going to lie between, so basically it is in this part, a plus b by two to b, then the kt is given by this expression. Now, when t is going to lie in this first sub interval, that is between a and a plus b by two, then we know that this term is. This positive part is going to be the same as a plus b by two minus t whole cube. So therefore, the kt, this function kt, so it is going to be one by six times b minus t raised to the power four divided by four minus four h by three. 
So the positive part of the function is the same. So this term is going to contribute now minus h by 3 p minus t whole q. Okay, but we have already simplified uh, the term without the middle term, right? That is these two terms together we have already simplified and we got this expression. So I'm just directly going to use this. So this is p minus t whole cube, b plus 2a minus 3t divided by 72. And then the only the second term will be remaining, the middle term basically. So it is going to be 4h by 18, a plus b by 2 minus t whole cube. Okay, and then again we have to simplify this. So let's see if we can uh, use the, some substitution. So b minus t, t minus t. Okay. So here in this term. So let me use B is what? B is uh, A plus 2H, right? So I can write this as A plus 2H minus T whole cube, B plus 2A minus 3T divided by 72 minus, this term is going to be 4H divided by 18. Okay, so a plus b by 2, a plus b by 2 minus t. So let me substitute here also b is equal to a plus 2h. So this is going to give us a plus h minus t whole cube. Okay, and again, uh, there's a lot of multiplication and simplification. So I'm just going to use in substitution here. So I'm going to set T minus A as X. Okay, just or X or you can use another variable here because uh, we are, okay, X is not here uh, present here. So this is just, uh, I'm setting it for uh, simplification. So if I use this, this is going to convert to 2H minus x whole cube and this term is going to be b minus a minus 3x divided by 72 minus 4h divided by 18 and h minus x whole cube okay now you can open the cubes here and simplify it so i'm directly going to write it So we will get it as 1 by 72 times 3 x raised to power 4 minus 4 h x cube. Okay. Or basically I can keep the factor x cube outside. So this is going to be 3 x times minus 4 h. Okay. And x is nothing but t minus a. So this is going to be t minus a whole cube divided by 72, 3t minus a minus 2b, okay? So everything I've, I've used again here, h is equal to b minus a by 2, right? So to bring everything in terms of the a and b. So this is what we get as kt, okay? So we have got the expression for the kt. In two cases, so we have two possible cases here that T is lying between A and A plus B by 2 and it is lying between A plus B by 2 and B. So in this case, we obtain this as 1 by 72. X T minus A cube, 3T minus A minus to be and in the other case we obtain 
1 by 72 b minus t whole cube b plus 2a minus 3t okay so we have this as kt and then the error formula which we obtained is this all right so let's give it question number three so this is four and this is five and uh, if we want to further simplify it so, so we can get the upper bound on this error so which is going to be so i'm going to take out the maximum of this function kt over the interval ab so i'll be left with this stuff okay so here this can further be simplified And again, uh, you have so you can observe that as a so this is a function in the variable t, and you it is like a polynomial of fourth order, right? So you have t minus a cube, and then this is like a linear polynomial in t. So this is a polynomial of degree four. So you can find its maximum over the interval a plus b by a to b, and upon simplification, you will get this as h raised to power four divided by seventy two. Okay, this again you can verify. So basically, I have that the upper bound of the error is given by this term. Ma'am, you are muted. So I got muted just now or it was muted before? So what I did you just know? OK, all right. So what I was telling that if you try to observe the form of these formulas, so we are getting it like even if you try now what I'm, I'm not going to do it for the composite Simpson rule. OK, you can try to do it for the. And you will observe that you will end up getting the similar form of the formula. Only thing is that the KT is going to be different. In the case of the uh, composite Simpson rule. Right, but you will be able to represent your error in the same similar form. Some function KT times the fourth derivative of the L. Into the integral of. The, this product over the interval AB. OK, so this KT which we are obtaining in uh, each of the, the cases. So this is called the piano kernel. OK, for the same reason we are getting we are calling these formulas as the. So this is due to due to the piano. So this is called the piano kernel. So which. Uh, so this kernel is basically different in each of the cases. Right, but the representation of the formulas you can see it is it is similar. OK, so for example, if you. Try to object the general case, right, because we are approximating F by a. Interpolating polynomial of degree N and then that's what we are using to derive the formula for. The, uh, the integral of the. Right, so even for the general case, 
the, the form of the formula is going to be the similar. That is, you will get it as A to B times. So the integrand is going to be KT times the n plus 1 of the derivative of the T dt. Okay, so this is uh, true for n is equal to. So we have already obtained in the case of the n is equal to 1 and 3. Okay, and KT, the expressions of the KT we have already seen. All right. So uh, this basically uh, the one more observation you can make that the reason why we all start we started with all these formulas that we didn't want it, the evaluation of the derivatives of the function at the unknown points, right? So here you can see that it does not involve the unknown points, but of course you have to integrate the uh, the whichever the derivative is involved that that has to be integrated over the interval a b. Okay. So is is the idea clear here for the piano kernel formulas? OK, so. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to do it for the composite rule. The same idea stands here for the composite rule. Also, what you have to do. So. Till this point, everything is going to be the same. Only thing is that the error formula, what we have here, that is going to be for the composite Simpson rule. OK, so here this approximation, what we are using here, you will be using the composite Simpson rule here, and then you will be applying the same trick that wherever you don't have the inter in integral from A to B, you will try to use the positive part of the function. And that will give you the finally you will be able to write the formula in this way. OK, of course, the, the poly the polynomial which you're going to get in the KT as a KT that is going to be a lengthy expression. So that is the reason I'm just avoiding writing it. But if the idea is clear, you will be able to write it write, write down the stuff. So if you have any doubts here, you can ask. Me. OK, so if not, then. Uh, uh, let's continue. So, so far, whatever uh, we have learned, so this these these formulas, as I had mentioned before, they all fall into the. Category of. Newton Bohr's formulas, right? Right, that is we just used. Uh, the approximation of the function by interpolating polynomial and then we use them to derive the. The weights. So there's another class of the, the integration formulas, which is. Uh, due to the Gauss, so this is called the Gaussian quadrature formulas. Let's see how it differs from the, the quadrature formulas which we have learned so far. So what we have done in, for example, in the Simpson case and the triple order rule we have seen in detail. So what we have in, in, in these two integration rules, how did we obtain? So we basically fix the nodes. So we had the equally spaced nodes. So let's call the interval AD. So in the case of the triple order rule, we just took uh, the approximation of the function by a linear polynomial over this interval. Or even in the case of the composite rule, we just divided this uh, interval into a length of equal, uh, sub intervals which equal lengths, right? And then we apply the approximation by the linear interpolating polynomial of each of the sub intervals, right? And in the case of the Simpson rule, we just uh, approximated the function by the quadratic interpolating polynomial. And in the case of the composite, we just considered the equal subdivision and use the polynomial uh, interpolating Polynomial approximation. Right, this is what we have been doing. Right, so basically we have been knowing the nodes that which nodes we are going to consider, and then we have been deriving the weights. Right, so this is the idea I explained in the methods of uh, undetermined coefficient also that you have obtained the formula of this form. So the XJs were fixed, right? So XJs were they were equally spaced points. 
in the interval A, B, D, and then we determine these weights W Z using the. So we have seen two ways. So firstly, we just use the interpolating polynomial. So we basically these W Z was nothing but the integral of the basis polynomial, Lagrange basis polynomials, right? And secondly, we have also seen that we can determine these weights by using the methods of undetermined coefficients, right? So let's write it down what we have done. So the general form. Of integration rule is is this right? So, so where we determined the weights. Such that this quadrature rule is so. Let's give a question number. So let me start with one again because I'm starting a new section. So so this quadrature rule, which is in one, this is exact for. So can you tell me, suppose if I'm applying the method of the undetermined coefficient to determine these WZs, so what is the condition I have to impose? That this rule has to be exact for, what is the polynomial degree? Are you guys with me? Yes. Are you following what I'm trying to convey? So what is the, uh, so in case of the, so suppose I have to determine these WZs, right? And I'm going to apply the method of undetermined coefficient because the outcome is the same. But either you use the, uh, you integrate the basis polynomials or you use the method of undetermined coefficient. You get the same form. So if you apply the method of undetermined coefficient, then you get the coefficients you have it here. The coefficients we have, and that's one, right? So you have to impose the condition that uh, this rule is going to be exact for Polynomials. Polynomials degree less than equals to n. Of degree less than equal to n. Right. So this is what the, uh, we will be doing if we were using the approach which we have learned so far. Right. But what is the idea of the Gaussian quadrature? So the idea here is that that this rule which we have here in the one, we can make it exact for the polynomial of degree. Say here it is going to be 2n plus 1, but by doing what? What we have to do additional so that we get a higher accuracy of the formulas. So the change here is going to be that I'm not going to fix the nodes here. Okay. So, like in the case of we have learned so far, the xj's were fixed. Okay. And then we were determining the w's. So the this new rule, new formulas which we are going to see, they are all. In these formulas, we are going to determine xj's also. So xj's are also going to be as a variable. Okay. So let's write it down. Then it will be more clear. So here, so it is possible to make these rules. Exact for the higher polynomial degree. So it is also possible to derive a quadrature rule which is going to be exact for polynomials of. degree less than equal to 2n plus 1, which you can see from here that I'm going to take WJs also as an unknown and XJs also as an unknown. 
So total number of unknowns are going to be 2n plus 2. So I have to impose the condition that this rule is going to be exact for 2n plus 1. So, so underlying idea is the same. Whatever we have done in the case of the method of undetermined coefficients, only thing is that there we were determining the WJs only, but now we have to determine the XJs only. So this gives us extra degrees of freedom. Okay, so we can make this rule exact for the polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2 and plus 1 by choosing n plus 1 nodes and weights together. Okay. And when we say that this rule, what we are going to derive, this is going to be exact for the polynomial of degree less than or equal to 2 and plus 1. You clearly can see that it is more accurate than the existing rules because the existing rule. They are going to be accurate for the degree n, but at the same time, these rules are going to be accurate for the degree 2 and plus 1. OK, so they are basically they are going to have better accuracy than the Newton codes formula. So let's just consider uh, uh, the stable case and try to obtain these formulas. So let I'm going to consider the integral of the function f not on the interval any general interval a b. I'm going to take a particular interval which is minus one to one. Okay, and I'm going to explain the things for this interval and then we will see that how we can use these ideas to derive the formulas for the general interval AB. Okay, so what we are interested, we are interested in finding the approximate uh, value of this integral, which is going to be of this form. And here I'm going to determine They are to be determined in such a way that let this rule. So let's number it. So this rule is exact. Whenever fx is a polynomial of degree less than or equal to 2 and plus 1. Okay, that is, I'm going to have that this the value of the fx over this. Uh, this interval. So if you integrate fx over this interval, then this is going to be exactly the same as the value which will be coming by using this formula. So this holds for every polynomial. fx of degree less than or equal to 2n plus 1. That is whenever fx is a polynomial, any polynomial of degree less than or equal to 2n plus 1, this equality should hold. Okay, this is the meaning of the rule is exact for the polynomial of degree less than or equal to 2n plus 1. Right? Now you can notice that this condition, this is equivalent to say that, that this equation Three, this holds for fx equal to the constant function x, x square up to x raised to power 2n plus 1. 
because we know that this set 1x x square up to x raised to power n 2n plus 1 this is going to form the basis for the polynomial polynomial space which is of uh, which is of degree less than equal to 2n plus 1 right so any polynomial of degree less than equal to 2n plus 1 can be written as a linear combination of these functions right so if the rule is exact for these functions then it is going to be exact for any polynomial of degree less than equal to 2n plus 1 so is it okay the uh, are you guys with me that what is happening here yes ma'am okay so uh, let's take the simplest case and try to obtain this formula so i'm going to consider the case uh, when n is equal to 0 right so that is the simplest possible case uh, we can have here So in this case, what will happen to the equation number two? So which is given by two. So this is going to B that I am having the approximation of this integral by W naught into Fx naught as n is equal to 1 here. Okay, so I have to determine W naught and Fx naught. Okay. So by equation 3, we already have that this rule is. So I have to impose the condition that this rule is exact for the polynomial of degree less than equal to 1, which basically requires me to have that fx equal to 1 will satisfy this exactly and fx is equal to x will satisfy this exactly. So if I substitute fx is equal to 1, so I will get this as so fx is 1, so this is going to be w naught only. So the integral here is going to be 2. Okay, and if I substitute fx is equal to x, so I will get this as w naught into fx naught. fx naught is going to be x naught. And if you simplify this, this is going to be, so this is an odd function. So integrating from minus 1 to 1, so this will give you 0. Okay. So we got that W naught is equal to 2. So W naught is a non-zero quantity. So this will imply that X naught is going to be 0. Okay. So what we have obtained the formula as. So we have obtained that we can find the approximate value of this integral using 2 times of F evaluated at 0. Okay. So this is a Gaussian rule for n is equal to 0. Integration rule or quadrature rule, both, both stands for the same thing. So integration rule for n is equal to 0. Hmm. So now let's uh, check what happens in the case of uh, n is equal to 1. Okay, one more remark before that. So, so note that we have already obtained these weights. Uh, so weight here is W naught and X naught so that this rule is exact for the polynomial of degree less than equal to 1, right? But you can clearly check that uh, this rule is not exact for the quality of polynomials. And how will I check this?
suppose I want to just check that this uh, this rule which we have de derived here, that is two times of the F naught. This is not exact for the quadratics, quadratic polynomials. So what it suffice to check? So you can simply take the function fx is equal to x square, and you can see what is happening. You can find the exact value of this integral, right? And then you can find the value using the the integration rule, which is nothing but the two times of the f naught. So this is going to be zero here, right? So if I call this is as i one f, and this is the i f. So i f is So x cube divided by three and minus one to one. So this is going to be two by three, right? And i one f is two times of the f naught, f evaluated at zero, which is not, which is nothing but zero. So clearly you can see that i f and i one f they are not same. Okay. So this rule is exact only for the polynomial of degree less than equal to one. So it is not exact for the quadratic polynomials. Or for for that matter, any polynomial of higher degree than one. Okay, now let's take the another case, which is uh, the case n is equal to one, and try to see what is the the formula which we are going to get in this case. So, so in this case, the integration rule which we have. Uh, In two, is going to give us that the approximation which I am seeking for i f, it is w naught f x naught plus w one f x one. And we are going to just let's call it as i two f. Okay. And here uh, you know that uh, w naught, w one, x naught, x one, they all are unknown. Okay. So here, uh, so by three, so we determine. W naught, W one, X naught, and X one using three. That is by making this rule exact for F X equal to one X X square and X cube, right? So this will give us the following equations. So if we substitute x is equal to f x is equal to one, so I will get this as uh, this side. It is going to be minus one to one dx, and this side I am going to get it w naught plus w one. So This is two here, right? Now, if we substitute uh, f x is equal to x, so I will get this as uh, this factor, and here it is going to be w naught x naught plus w one x one, and this is zero. Okay. Now let's substitute x is equal f x is equal to x square, so we get this as, and here I'm going to get it as w naught x naught square. Plus w one x one square, and upon simplification, we will get this as two by three. And the last uh, equation we we will get by substituting f x is equal to x cube. So this is going to be w naught x naught cube plus w one x one cube, and this upon simplification is going to again give us zero because x cube is an odd function. Okay. So we have got four equations: w naught plus w one. This is equal to two. W naught x naught plus w one x one. This is equal to zero. W naught x naught square 
plus w1 x1 square this is equal to 2 by 3 and w0 x0 cube plus w1 x1 cube this is equal to 0. Okay. And note that this is a nonlinear system because here it is linear in w i's but it is nonlinear in x i's but x i's and w i's both are unknown. So this is a nonlinear system. And you try to solve it. Okay, it, it does have a solution and you have to, uh, but it's not directly like, in the case of the linear systems, you can directly apply, form it in the matrix, form the matrix equation and solve it. So that is not going to work here. You have to, uh, so let me just leave it as an exercise, solving part of this. Okay, and if you have any queries there, we can discuss it later. And upon solving, what we will get as a solution? So we'll get W0 equals 1 and W1 is 1. X0 is going to be 1 by root 3. You know, this is going to be minus 1 by root 3 and x1 is going to be 1 by root 3. Okay, so basically we get the integration rule as So let me directly write uh, for the I2 here. So I2F is W0, which is 1, times F evaluated at X0, so which is 1 by minus 1 by root 3, plus W1 is also 1, and X1 is 1 by root 3. Okay, so this we have obtained as an approximation of the integral of F over the interval minus 1 to 1. Okay, so let's call it uh, 2 and let's call this as 3. And this is 4. Okay. And you can check here that this rule is not exact for polynomial of degree 4. Okay. Of course, it is exact for the polynomials of degree less than or equal to 3 because this is how we have designed it, right? but it is not exact for the polynomial of degree four or higher. And how will, you, how will you check this? What you have to do to check that this is not exact for the polynomial of degree 4? fx equals to x to the power 4. Yeah, so you can simply verify what happens for the case of fx is equal to x raised to power 4. Okay. And see whether uh, the value which you will get upon using this uh, this rule, the Gaussian quadrature rule for the case n is equal to 1. And you can find its exact value over the interval minus 1 to 1 and check both are not same. Okay, so in, in general case, that is uh, when n is greater than two, you have to apply the same idea that uh, we are going to find
W eyes and X eyes. in this formula such that this rule is exact for polynomials of degree less than equal to 2n plus 1 because how many unknowns we have here we have w w i is are n plus 1 and x i is are n plus 1 so we have total 2n plus 2 unknowns right so i can impose a condition that this rule is exact for the polynomial of degree less than equal to 2n plus 1 that will give us 2n plus 2 equations and we expect to get a solution upon solving those 2n plus 2 equations right so so this inf this has 2n plus 2 unspecified parameters which are x size and w i's which we are going to determine by forcing the integration rule to be exact for 2n plus 2. So we are just going to test it with the two other uh, monomials which are given by one x x square up to x raised to power 2n plus 1. Okay, and this uh, when you will use that this rule which we have written here, this is exact for all these polynomials. This will give rise to the following system, nonlinear systems. So I'm going to get the system as, so there'll be 2n plus 2 equations and these equations are going to be wj's xi is to power, sorry wj xj is to power i, j is varying from 0 to n. This is going to be 0 when i equals 1, 3, that is any of the odd number and it is going to be 2 divided by i plus 1 then i is going to be even number. Okay. And note that this is a nonlinear system. So I'm, I'm claiming that this has a solution, but solving this system for any general case, that is for the case n greater than or equal to 2, it's not trivial. Okay. So usually there's another approach which is being opt to derive these formulas. But I think... Uh, uh, I'm going to stop here because there's some construction work going on, which is really handling the noise, it's creating a lot of noise here. So we have a uh, few minutes. If you guys have any questions, you can ask now. I'm not sure even if I'm audible. So I'm just telling that I'm stopping here because there's some work is going on somewhere. So it's creating a lot of noise here. So uh, I will continue from here in the next lecture, but I can take any questions if you have.